Uh, Henry the Fourth, Part Two, should be Act Two. Uh, but before we jump into that, as much as I hate to do it, we're going to drop Henry the Fifth. Um, and I really hate to because Henry the Fifth's got some really great passages, but we have to if we want to attempt to uh, cover the remaining plays that I have on the syllabus, which are Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Lear, Antony, Cleopatra, Winter's Tale, and The Tempest. Um, and I definitely don't want to drop either Winter's Tale or The Tempest because they're two very late romances. Uh, Tempest is probably the last thing Shakespeare wrote. Winter's Tales within two to three years um, of that, and they 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 give you a different cast of mind, a different approach, understanding of, of life maybe than some of the others do, and the tragedies build up to that. And I want to include, I, I don't want to drop, but we can't drop Hamlet or Lear because they're the greatest tragedies written in the English language. And I don't want to drop Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra because one of the interesting things about those two plays is that you get a character who's in both of them. Caesar obviously dies in the first place, so he's not in the second one. But we see Mark Antony in Julius Caesar as a young man, and then we see Mark Antony in Antony and Cleopatra as an old man beyond his prime. And we see the transformation um, in his character, so I don't want to drop that one either, so... Henry V is it. Um, what that means is uh, I've got to write you an exam for the histories. It'll just be over the three, Richard II and the two Henry IV plays. Um, and I'll probably try to do that and give it to you on Thursday and have it be due a week or two later, something like that. It won't be, you know, due the following um, Tuesday. It'll be at least a week, probably a week and a half. Okay. All right. So, Henry the Second. Uh, sorry, Henry the Fourth. Brain's already dead. Um, Henry the Fourth, Part Two, Act Two, uh, which we're going to skip quite a bit of. We want to pick up where the Chief Justice comes in. Now, we've already been introduced to the Chief Justice in Henry IV, Part One briefly. He comes to tell Falstaff, this is pages 840, 841. He comes to tell Falstaff in the first play um, that he's needed a court, you know, essentially that he's going to be given a commission to take troops to the Battle of Shrewsbury, okay? So now we get introduced to the Chief Justice again. Sorry, not 848, 41, 838, and 39. And 839, the Chief Justice is brought in with his men because there's been a complaint against Falstaff because he's not paying his debts. His debts primarily to Mr. Squickley. Okay? So, um, Let's pick up with page 840. And Falstaff and the Chief Justice are talking. And it's in the speech where the Chief Justice is speaking, beginning around line 107. Um, and I want to pick up later on in the speech the last sentence of the Chief Justice's line. You have, as it appears to me, Practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman, and made her serve her your excuse me, made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. In other words, she's kind of bankrolled your activities and bedrolled your activities. Okay? Purse, financial, person, her body. Hostess, yea, in truth, my lord. Pray the, you know, shh, let me talk. Pay her the debt you owe her and unpay the villainy you have done her. 
Well, how can he unpay the villainy he has done to her? Marry her. Marry her. Okay. The one you may do with sterling money and the other with current repentance. In other words, he doesn't say marry her, as Brandy suggests. He's saying stop. Stop abusing her. Using her. Okay. False self. I will not undergo this sneep without reply. That is, I'm not going to undergo this accusation without giving my own two cents. You call honorable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make curtsy and say nothing, he is virtuous. No, my lord, my humble duty remembered, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. In other words, take your men away. I have things to do for the king. You speak as having power to do wrong. But answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy the poor woman. Okay, look at your gloss 128. In effect of your reputation, in a manner becoming a man of your reputation. Well, what is Falstaff's reputation? Knight. Yes, he's a knight. But look at his name. He's a fallen staff. Okay? He's a fallen knight. What is his reputation at court? Is it like Hotspur's was? No. It's just the opposite. He's what? A fat old man who robs people and visits whorehouses. That's pretty much the most you can hope for. Even though, after the end of the first play, what has Hal let slide about Falstaff? What did Falstaff claim at the end of the first play? He killed Hotspur. He killed Hotspur. Notice, Hal doesn't correct that. He's like, whatever. Why? Hal's not concerned, apparently, with Verbal honor or reputation. Okay. Skip to 2-2. Two, two. We see him, um, Prince Henry come in with wands. And Henry says, or the prince says, Before God, I'm exceeding weary. Is it come to that? I thought weariness durst not have attached one of so high blood. In other words, no, not someone like you. You can't be weary. Faith, it does me. Though it discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Verbally, I'm ashamed to say this, is what he means. Okay. Doth it not show vile, vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. That is, a prince shouldn't be so closely looked at. Okay? To remember, to be reminded that he likes cheap beer. Belike then my appetite was not princely got, for by my troth, that is by my truth, or by my faith, I do now remember the poor creature, small beer, but indeed these humble considerations Make me out of love with my greatness. He's kind of saying, I remember the good old days when I used to sit around here with you and Bardolph and Pito and Falstaff, etc. But now I have to think of my greatness as impending kingship. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name. It's a disgrace. Keep in mind, what are members of the royal family, males particularly, often called? Your grace. What a disgrace. How ungracing it is for me. That is, how unroyally it is to me remember to remember your name. Okay? Back in the first Henry II play, what does Hal say in that first scene that we see him in when everybody else leaves and he's all alone? He gives us that great soliloquy when he says, I know all of you. 
I know what you're about. I know what you're doing. And I am pretending to be your friend, etc., etc. Okay? So he goes on. Or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, viz. these and those that were thy peach-colored ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use, but that the tennis court keeper knows better than I. For it is a low ebb of linen with thee, when thou keepest not racket here, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of the low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland. There's a joke in there. The low countries, Holland. Holland is part of the low countries of northwestern Europe. Okay? But notice, he also mentions here, at to scene two, tennis rackets. Why? Because we're not doing it, unless I change my mind by the end of class. Because Henry V begins with Henry receiving the king, Henry V at that point receiving ambassadors from France. And the ambassador from France brings in a casket, a little box. And in that box are tennis balls. And it is a jibe. It is a practical joke by the Dauphin of France, that is, son to the king, <clears throat> saying, we're not afraid of your threats of war. Here, go play tennis. And Hal gives this great speech right at the opening of the play, kind of telling you, this isn't the body womanizer anymore. This is a young man who has set his steely sights to war, and France will pay for it. Okay? So, he goes on. And God knows whether those that ball out the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. Okay, now you've got... Big, long footnotes, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault, whereupon the world increases and kindreds are mightily strengthened. So, look at the footnotes under the first column, beginning with um, 18 to 22, but Holland, etc. The keeper of the tennis court, this is what this whole passage means. The keeper of the tennis court knows that your inventory of shirts is at a low ebb, and that you do not have a clean shirt to shift into, to change into, because you've not been seen at the tennis court lately. The reason being, you have sold or pawned your best shirt to pray, pay for your visits to brothels. Now he's saying this about pawns. You don't have a clean shirt to wear. Why? Because you sold your last good shirt so that you could visit the whores. Because if you're visiting the tennis courts, think Wimbledon. There's a royal box. Okay? You would dress nicely for this. So he goes on. The, uh, Bevington goes on with his notes. Um, you've sold upon your best shirt to pay for your visits to brothels. With wordplay on rest as meaning repose and remainder. On the low countries as meaning the Netherlands, the nether areas... <coughs> Okay. And the lower members, the sexual organs, on shift as meaning contrivance and change of clothes, and on Holland as meaning fine linen from Holland and the Netherlands. Again, as I've said many times before, Samuel Johnson said, Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like. If he can pun on a word or a multiplicity of words in short proximity to each other, he will do so even though the audience will sit there and have to scratch their heads for a while to make sense of everything. Because imagine, this is being delivered fairly quickly. So a lot of it goes right over people's heads. All right? So, skip a little bit. Um, go on to 37. Uh, No, let's, um, 42. By this hand, it's an oath. He's kind of, you know, like raising his hand like he's swearing something. By this hand, thou thinks me as far in the devil's book as thou in Falstaff for obduracy and, pers and persistency. 
Let the end try the man. Two words there are important. End and try. What does he mean by end? Result. Result. Final state or final condition. Try the man. So then what does try mean? Judge. What else? How about <clears throat> prove? Let the end prove the man. Let the end show. In other words, Al is saying it's not the journey. It's the destination. It's the final point. Let the final state of the man show what? That person's quality. Okay? Why might he be saying that? Because right now, he's, this hasn't really accomplished anything worth it. Yeah, I mean, okay, he slew false, he slew Hotspur, but nobody really knows that. I mean, I kind of imagine he told his father and said, but we're going to let Falstaff take the glory for that. Okay? But he still hasn't done a lot. At this point, Henry IV, you know, kind of, I mean, he showed himself well at Shrewsbury. He offered single combat with Hotspur. Okay? So, let the end try the man. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. Inwardly. What's he saying? Outwardly, he's not showing any care or concern. And keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. Ostentation. That's showing. <clears throat> okay. Pause. The reason? Why? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. Why would he think him a hypocrite? Why would you weep for your father? Paul seems to be indicating there's no lo love lost between you two. Okay. It would be every man's thought, Hal says. If I were to publicly weep for my father's illness, he says, not only you, Ponce. And, and bear in mind, Ponce is not just anybody. Neither is Pito or Bardolf or Falstaff. They're close friends. They're not just the average Joe on the street. He's saying the average Joe on the street would think I'm a hypocrite if they saw me weeping for my father. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Okay. Why? Because you have been so lewd and so much in graft to false stuff. Lewd, base, common. In other words, you haven't acted like the Prince of Wales. You haven't acted like the next in line. You haven't shown proper deference to your father. You sh you've acted like Falstaff is your father. And to thee, you too, Pons. Yep. I agree. So Bardolf comes in with a page. We're going to skip the rest of that scene and go on to 2-3. Okay, now remember, how did Henry IV Part One end? Who's been defeated? Hotspur. Hotspur. Who else? The Douglas. The Douglas? Have Mortimer and Glendower been defeated? 
No. Has Northumberland been defeated? No. So you still have the Civil War. Okay. So, 2-3, Northumberland and his wife come in. And Northumberland says, I've got to go off to war. Lady Percy, his wife. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wife to Hotspur, his daughter-in-law. Northumberland's daughter-in-law. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. The time was, Father, that you broke your word. When you were more endeared to it than now, when your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, threw many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers, but he did long in vain. He did long, he did desire your powers in vain. She's saying, why are you going to go off to war now when you could have really been used a few weeks ago? Who, who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honors lost, yours and your son's. She's kind of saying to him, you're not going to get your honor back by going and fighting the king now. No, your honor's gone, old man. For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. For his, <laughs> it stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven, and by his light did all the... Chivalry of England moved to do brave acts. Hotspur moved all the chivalry of England to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. She's saying Hotspur was the mirror for knights. They would look in that mirror and they would see Hotspur. That's how they tried to dress themselves in chivalry. You had a book, real popular, a little bit before Shakespeare, but even in Shakespeare's early year, which I've written up here before, The Mirror for Magistrates. Right? <coughs> book of Virtue. How to be a virtuous leader. Okay? You also had Baldassar Castiglione, an Italian, wrote a book called The Book of the Courtier, which was translated into English, was also How to Be a Good Knight. So, he had no legs that practiced not his gait. That is, everybody even tried to walk like Hotspur. They wanted to have that swagger that he had. And speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, that is, he spoke in a northern accent, became the accents of the valiant. Because he spoke in a northern accent, all the young knights of England also spoke in a Northumbrian accent. They tried to mimic Hotspur. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark in glass, copy and book that fashioned others. Now, Shakespeare is having Lady Percy talk about Hotspur this way. In Shakespeare's own day, however, there was a knight who was like this. Sir Philip Sidney. In, who died as a result of his battle in the Low Countries. He was only 23 or so. I don't remember his exact age, but he's very young. Sidney was also a poet. He wrote the sonnet sequence, Astrophil and Stella. He was also a literary critic. He wrote an apology for poetry, or it's also called The Defense of Poesy, one of the greatest works of literary criticism in the English language, where he argues for why literature is the most important form of writing. More important than philosophy, more important than theology, more important than history. Why? Because his literature doesn't only explain how things are, it explains how things can be. How you can change the world. Okay? He was the model and glass of knighthood. He could dance, he could write, he could sing, he could play music, he could fight. And he died fighting the Catholics. I mean, what a great death, especially in the Elizabethan period. 
1588 is when he dies, at a pretty young age. He also challenged the queen. Okay? When she was thinking of, apparently, marrying Philip II of Spain, he said, you can't do that. And she kind of banished him from court for a while, because, I mean, he was only 21 or so when he did this. All right? So her description of Hotspur could easily apply to Sydney. And I think probably when people viewed this play, because Sydney's death was relatively recent, they probably imagined somebody like Philip Sydney. So she goes on. O miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you. What does that mean, unseconded by you? He's no longer the next in line. No. Exactly. That's referring to dueling. If I were to challenge Andrew to a duel, Andrew would then have a second. Somebody that he would ask, in case he were unable to complete the duel, stand in for him. And I would have a second. Okay? So maybe the morning of the duel, he wakes up. <laughs> I don't feel well, you know. And somebody else takes his place. Okay? But she says, Hotspur was what? Unseconded by you. He didn't have you to back him up. To look upon the hideous God, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous God of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. That is not, so you left him. It's, so you left him. Emphasizing each syllable. Get the impression she's a little bit upset with her father-in-law? <clears throat> no, never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with them. Let them alone. That is, the others in the... Con Let them do what they want. Northumberland, be shrew your heart, fair daughter. You do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. That is, I've got to marshal my troops and go meet the king, or he will find me when I least expect it. Okay? If they get round, she goes on, Invent, if they get ground, advantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. Let them go out first and get the upper hand. And then you can come in like what? Like the proverbial knight on a shining horse. And you be the one to get the glory for the victory. Okay? Um, let's see, now I'm going to skip that. 2-4, we're going to skip. Um, except for line 234. 233 and 34. Doll, one of the waitresses, servers, whatever you want to call her, who works at the tavern of at Mistress Quickly's, comes in and says just before 233 and 34, uh, Invade, and thou fallest him like a church. Thou was a little tiny Bartholomew boy pig. When wilt thou leave fighting the days and fighting in the nights and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? That is, when will you prepare for death? And the prince in Pons comes in described as drawers, we're told. Not these kind of drawers, but people. And Falstaff says, Peace, good doll, do not speak like a death's head. 
Do not bid me remember mine end. What's he mean like a death's head? A skull. A skull, okay. Why is a skull called a death's head? No. <clears throat> There's a very famous picture of Erasmus of, of Rotterdam, okay? Um, early 16th century scholar, regarded as, you know, the greatest scholar of the day. And it's of Erasmus, and he's sitting there, and he's got his hand like this, if I remember correctly, and his hand is on a skull. And he's dressed in all of his finery, and his hand's on a skull. The skull is the memento mori, reminder of death. Here he is in his youth, dressed in all his finery. And the skull reminds him what? You too will die. All right? Um, we just finished last week in my... 3010 course, Beowulf. And there's a great speech in Beowulf by the character Hrothgar. It's right after Beowulf kills Grindel and Grindel's mother. And Hrothgar, and Beowulf's relatively young, supposedly. We're not quite sure how old he is there. Um, but he's possibly young. And Hrothgar says, essentially, Beowulf, remember, you will die. Don't get cocky. Don't get full of pride. Well, the poet seems to be suggesting there, no matter what happens, remember you will die. In other words, prepare for death. Falstaff, don't speak like a death's head. Don't remind me. Do not bid me remember mine end. Why not? Why doesn't Falstaff want to be reminded of his end? Remember the end? Doth try the man? The end proves the man? Well, how's Falstaff been living? Apparently, most of his life. Not very proof worthy. Okay. So you, you get this little hint there, false stuff doesn't want to think about death. Why not? Not prepared? Obviously. So, Peto comes in, page 848, and he tells Hal, your father's at Westminster, the king your father's at Westminster, line 355, and there are 20 weak and weary posts come from the north. That is, messages and as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking everyone for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, bronze, I feel me much to blame, so idly to profane the precious time, when tempest of commotion, like the south born with black vapor, doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare, unarmed heads. That is all to say... I've been wasting my time. I haven't been properly using the time. So he leaves. And we get Act 3, Scene 1. Okay. Which we're going to see Hal come in. And we're going to have another scene between father and son. But here the king comes in, in his nightgown. And he's coughing. He's ill. He's not at this point on his deathbed, but he's really close. Okay. And I highly recommend the, the Hollow Crown version of this film. They cut a lot out, but Jeremy Irons is just superb as um, Jeremy Irons. Yeah, Jeremy Irons as Henry the Fourth. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep. Gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse. 
how have I frighted thee? That thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. Now, if you're still trying to think of a paper topic, if you've not come up with one, sleep in Shakespeare could be a pretty interesting topic. Because you see it in Midsummer Night's Dream, you see it here, you see it in Hamlet, okay? you see it in The Tempest. It's, a, it's an important theme because sleep isn't only sleep for Shakespeare and in Shakespeare's day. Sleep is also a metaphor, obviously, for death. Why rather sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets, stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber, then in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody? That is, why do people in hovels, smoky rooms, stretch out and fall asleep easily? And sleep doesn't come to those in perfumed chambers under the canopies of costly state. If you ever get an opportunity to go to London, you know, go to, um, go to Buckingham Palace, okay? Go to um, Henry VIII's house. been to several times, and its name is escaping me, in Richmond. Um, palace that Cardinal Wolsey built that Henry took from him, essentially. Hampton Court. Go to Hampton Court and look at Henry VIII's bed. The bed is probably... From me to that wall, from this wall, yeah, probably to about right here. It is massive. The posts on it or like a foot in diameter. And it's like eight feet tall. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Why can't somebody with that kind of bed, massively soft cushion, music playing in the background, perfume, not fall asleep, while somebody in a smoky tavern or in a smoky bedroom that has a fire in the grate and the chimney's clogged? Falls asleep easily. Oh, thou dull God. Why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds? He doesn't mean vile necessarily. Horrible, rotten, foul, unvirtuous. He means common. Just common people. In loathsome beds... In leave us the kingly couch, a watch case, or a common larum bell. Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mass seal up the ship boy's eyes? What's he talking about? The boy who is up in the crow's nest, at the top of the tallest mast. Okay, why is he up in the crow's nest? He's the lookout. He's the one who calls... And ho! Or ship ho! Okay? Who falls asleep on the job. You're not supposed to fall asleep when you're a lookout. And rock his brains and cradle of the rude imperious surge and in the visitation of the winds. Well, notice, he's just said, why does he fall asleep? Because being in that cross, I personally would not find it like being in a cradle, but it's like being in a cradle. Okay? He's rocking to and fro with the motion of the swells, who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor in the slippery clouds. He's saying that even in the midst of wild storms, this boy falls asleep, while I, in my big, soft, sumptuous bed, don't. Canst thou, O oh partial sleep, Partial. How so? Because you're going to sleep, and you're going to sleep, the rest of you, nope. You're going to have insomnia. No matter how tired you get. 
or partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot. Appliances and means. Does he have a footnote for that? Age to induce sleep. He's not merely talking about music and perfume. They knew about drug age to induce sleep in Shakespeare's day. He's talking about those two. Okay. Will you deny it to a king? Then happy low lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Ah, the crown does not confer peace. It doesn't confer stillness. It doesn't confer happiness. <clears throat> okay. So Warwick comes in with others. And the king asks, is it good morrow? Is it after midnight? It's all he means. Tis one o'clock and past. Why then, good morrow to you all, my lords. He asks, have you read the letters? They say, we have. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. He's warned them. It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My Lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. Notice, he implies a what about Lord Northumberland? He's feverish. He'll be cooled. The fever will go away. The body will become temperate. That's why he says... It is as a body, yet distemperate. It's out of its temper. The temper will come back, or temperature will come back. King. <laughs> oh, God. That one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent weary of solid firmness melt itself into the sea and other times to see the beachy girl of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances, mocks, and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. What does he mean? What goes around comes around. Mountains fall, continents dissolve, kings die, Oh, if this were seen, the happiest youth viewing his progress through what perils past, what crosses to ensue, that is, crosses yet to come, would shut the book and sit him down and die. That is, if the youth could read the book of fate and see this is what it was like in the past, this is what it's like now. And guess what the future is going to be like? What it was like in the past. He would close the book and do what? Die. Why? Wouldn't want to face the future. Tis not ten years gone <clears throat> since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together. And in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul. Meaning, it's been eight years since Percy helped me to the throne. Notice how Shakespeare, you know, compresses time and expands time. A <coughs> uh, man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot, yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which of you was by? Which of you was near then? You, cousin Neville, he says to Warwick, as I may remember when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, did checked and rated by Northumberland, you spoke these words, now proved a prophecy. Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne? That is, Warwick, you said these. 
Northumberland is the ladder by which Bolingbroke becomes king. Though then God knows I had no such intent. Well, okay, yeah. Easy to say now. <laughs> Eight years later. He's kind of saying, I never intended Northumberland what? Put me up to it. I just wanted my lands. It was Northumberland that made me king. I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. Notice that. Necessity bowed the state to what? Me. And I bowed to it. And we kissed in the middle. The time shall come, thus did he follow it. The time will come, that foul sin, gathering heads, shall break into corrupt. So went on, foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity, our peace, our friendship. Warwick. There is a history in all men's lives figuring the nature of the times deceased, the past times. The witch observed, if you observe the past times, a man may prophesy. Why? George Santayana said it best. Those who fail to learn the lessons of the past are condemned to repeat them. Okay? If you figure the nature of the times deceased and observe them, then you can prophesy about what will come. If you see the patterns. With a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life, who in their seeds and weak beginnings lie in treasure. Such things become the hatch and brood of time. By the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland then falls to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness. In other words, Richard could have told you, Bolingbroke. If you do this, you better watch out for Northumberland. Depose one king, it's pretty easy to depose a second king after that. From what I've been told, from what I've read, killing your first person, that's the hard thing. Two, three, four, five, six, whatever, those are easy. Are these things then necessities? What's he mean? What's necessity? Chaucer as the knight in his Canterbury Tales talk about, I think it's the knight, talk about to mock in a virtue of necessity, to make a virtue of necessity. What is necessity though? Fate. Fate. It cannot be changed. Okay. The king is asking, are these things then fate? Must this happen? Is there no turning it around? Then let us meet them like necessities. Okay. If Northumberland is fate, he says, then let's meet them like fate. Hammer? Meet Anvil. <laughs> That's essentially what he's saying here. In that same word, even now, cry, cries out on us. They say the bishop and Northumberland are 50,000 strong. War, it can't be. Nope. Rumor. Rumor doth double like the voice and echo the numbers of the fear. Well, how did the play begin? <clears throat> Rumor. Rumor spreads from Shrewsbury and goes to Northumberland and says, What? Your son lives. Douglas lives. The king is dead. And then word is brought, Nope. <laughs> the Douglas is captured. The king is alive. Your son is dead. Go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. King, I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the holy land. Notice, 
He still is thinking what? Need to go to Jerusalem. Need to pray for Richard's soul. Need to check that, you know, bucket list box. All right. Shakespeare does the same thing he did with the previous play. Either a scene of court or a scene of um, council followed by a Falstaff cavern scene, okay? Which we're going to skip. It's a long one. Um, so we see Falstaff. He gets his troops. He has Bardolph lead the men away and pick up with Act 4. Archbishop of York comes in with Mowbray, Bardolph, Hastings, others, and the Archbishop says, um, let's pick up with 987. Pick up with line 7. I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, cold there is important, tenor and substance thus. Here doth he wish his person with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality, the which he could not levy. Notice, he wishes he could be here, but darn, he can't. He is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland. Scotland and England, separate countries at this time. Okay? So he's taking his forces over the border into Scotland. The border of Scotland is the border of Northumberland's land. Okay? And concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful meeting of their opposite. Mowbray, thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Damn, that's what he means. We're screwed. We can't win without Northumberland, right? Just like Battle of Shrewsbury. They couldn't win without Northumberland. If they'd had Northumberland, they probably would have won. Okay? So Westmoreland comes in. And Westmoreland addresses Mowbray and the Archbishop. Health and fair greeting from our general, the Prince Lord John, and Duke of Lancaster. That means second in line to the king. Okay. Even though he's just a boy at this point. Late teens at most. So, Westmoreland addresses the archbishop, calls him, you know, traitor and rebel and such. Says, the king will make you offers, etc., etc. The archbishop replies, and says, I want to pick up with 66. Okay. So he starts at 53, and he speaks for 13 lines. And then he says, hear me more plainly. In other words, let me make it crystal clear. This is, you know, George Bush's 1988, you know, read my lips speech. I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, our forces may do against the king, what wrongs we suffer, how the king has wronged us, and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. The pains we suffer are more than what we deserve. We see which way the stream of time doth run. And our enforcer arm was quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion. And have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles, which long ere this we offered to the king and might by no suit gain our audience. We tried to tell the king of our complaints and we couldn't gain an audience with him. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we're denied access unto his person, even by those men that most have done us wrong. That is, by the lords to the king. They're the ones keeping us away. The dangers of the days, but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood, and the examples of every minute's instance present now, hath put us in these ill-beseeming arms. 
not to break peace or any branch of it, but to establish here a peace indeed, concurring both in name and quality. In other words, we are here in arms to do what? Enforce, bring about a real peace. Peace is not merely the absence of open conflict, right? There is not quote-unquote peace on the Korean Peninsula just because the South and the North are not shooting at each other. Right? There is not quote-unquote peace between the United States and China or the United States and Russia just because we're not killing each other. He's saying, we want a real peace. We want a lasting peace. We want a just peace. We want our concerns heard, addressed, resolved. Westmoreland. When was your appeal denied? You say, tell me. Give me dates. Give me circumstances. Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to grate on you? that you should seal this lawless, bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine and consecrate commotion's bitter edge. He says, well, the commonwealth. Okay, so they talk back and forth. I'm going to skip the bunch again. And pick up with Westmoreland on 142. Yeah, Westmoreland. Here come I from our princely general to know your griefs. That is, I'm here from John of Lancaster. I want to know your griefs. To tell you from his grace, he will give you audience. And wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. The prince has given me command. Here are your complaints. And... He will give you audience. And if your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. That is, you will get what you demand. You will get what you want. You will get, essentially, ease of whatever your burdens are. Mowbray, but he hath forced us to compel this <clears throat> offer. And it proceeds from policy, not love. Policy. He's conniving. He's planning. Westmoreland. Mowbray, you overween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. The, the prince isn't afraid of you. Lon Lancaster, not Prince Hal. Okay? For lo, within kin our army lies, upon mine armor all, honor all too confident. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our army has more famous names, lords, among it than does yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms. Perfect there doesn't mean only they know what to do. Also means they are tried in arms. They've proven their worth. Our armor all is strong, and our cause, our cause is best. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, then reason will or heart should be as good. Okay, so Mowbray. No, no pardon. Hastings, 162. Hath the Prince John a full commission in very ample virtue of his father? What does virtue mean there? Power. Does he have the power of the king? To do what he says. Does he have the authority. To do what he says he will do. To hear and absolutely to determine. On what conditions we shall stand upon. That is intended in the general's name. I muse you make so slight a question. In other words. Duh. I'm, I'm surprised you even asked that. So the archbishop. Gives him his complaints. Okay. Act 4, scene 2. 
John of Lancaster comes in. Notice, where's Hal? Out of the picture. John is doing what essentially the Prince of Wales ought to be doing with this one little proviso. At the end of the first play, where was Hal sent? The king says after the Battle of Shrewsbury, what's going to happen? Hal and I are going to go west towards Wales. Lancaster will take an army and go up to Northumberland. This is a continuation of that. Okay. Has Hal gone west towards Wales yet? No, all we've seen him is what? In the caverns. Okay. So, um, Prince John comes in and he addresses Mowbray and the Archbishop. And he says, that they are abusing his father, the king, and pick up a 22. He says, oh, who shall believe, but you misuse the reverence of your place. Employ the countenance of grace of heaven as a false favorite doth this prince's name, in deeds dishonorable. In other words, you, archbishop, are using the title of archbishop, which is what? The person who stands in the place of God, for those of us here on earth. To do what? To mislead those beneath you. You make them think they are fighting for God's side. You have taken up, line 26, under the counterfeited zeal of God, the subjects of his substitute, my father. And both against the peace of heaven and him have here upsworn them. He says, no, 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 I'm not here against your father's peace. But as I told my war, lord of Westmoreland, time disorder, death and common sense, crowd us and crush us, do hold us. He says, no, no, I sent you parcels and particulars of our grief. H haven't you gotten them, etc.? Okay. 52, page 858. Westmoreland says, pleases your grace, pleaseth your grace to answer them directly, how far forth do you do like their articles? Prince John, I, I like them all. I don't have any problem with your complaints, is what he's saying. And do allow them well. And swear here by the honor of my blood. Honor of my blood means by my royal blood and the honor in my royalty. My father's purposes have been mistook. You guys have misinterpreted my father's deeds and plans. And some about him have too lavishly rested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties. That is, if what I have said pleases your ears, break up your armies and send some over here to this county, some over here to this county, some over here to this county. So what is he getting them to do? Divide their forces. As we will ours. And here between the two armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace that all their eyes may bear these tokens home of our restored love and amity. Let's have a party. Archbishop, I take your princely word for these redresses. I take your princely word means what? I accept you on your honor. I accept your word on your integrity as a prince, as a royal, that you will do what you've said. Okay? I give it to you and will maintain my word. And thereupon I drink unto your grace. They drink, they embrace Hastings tells the captain to go deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. So the captain goes to tell the army. He hands out script money. And he says, depart. You go here, you go there, etc. 
Okay? So, the prince, the archbishop, Mowbray, Westmoreland, they talk a while longer. Westmoreland leaves. Hastings leaves. Prince John says, I trust lords, we shall lie tonight together. That is, we will share a sleeping area like a pavilion. Westmoreland comes in. No, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? Uh, the leaders, having charged from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. Hastings comes in. Hastings says to the Archbishop, now notice that. The Westmoreland is like right-hand man to the prince. Okay? And he says, wherefore stands our army still? That is, why is our army still standing? Kind of at ready, Westmoreland. Well, they have charged from you. You ordered them to stand. They're not going to go until you speak, until you disperse them. They know their duties. Sounds fine. Hastings speaks to the Archbishop. Our army is dispersed already. Notice the prince's army is not dispersed. Our army is dispersed already, like youthful steers on yoke. They take their courses east, west, north, south, or like school broke up. In other words, the men are doing what? Hightailing it out of there. They want to go back home. Each hurries toward his home and sporting place. So the rebel army is dispersing in all directions. Westmoreland, good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest the traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Wait, is this proceeding just and honorable? Is your assembly so? That is, is your gathering together just and honorable? Westmoreland asks. Archbishop, will you break your faith? Who's he speaking to? Not Westmoreland. He's speaking to the prince. What does he mean by your faith? You gave us your word. Your word <laughs> based upon your royal blood. Line 112, Prince John. I pawned thee none. Pledged for pawn. I pledged you no faith. I promised you redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain, which by mine honor I will perform with a most Christian care. That is, I will redress these grievances. But for you rebels, look to taste the dew, meet for rebellion, and such acts as yours. In other words, others will get the redress. But you guys are rebels to the crown. No, no. You're going to get your redress, and it's death. Because that's what Rebels earn. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. What's he mean? It's not just kill those that didn't leave. Pursue the scattered means chase down those who are leaving. Kill them. Okay. God and not we have safely fought today. So, 4 3, we have Falstaff and Colville, Prince John and Westmoreland and the others come in. Um. Yeah, we'll skip that. Go on to 4-4. Four, four. And let's see here. We get the kings. Various sons come in. 
um, Thomas, Duke of Clarence, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, and let's see here. The king asks, essentially, where is Hal? Um, line 40, nine, line 50. The king asks Thomas, Duke of Clarence, why aren't there not at Windsor with him, Thomas? Uh, he's not there today. That is, Hal isn't at Windsor. He dines in London. Hal accompanied? Who's with him? Pons, other of his continual followers. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with. Therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape and forms imaginary, the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. He's telling his youngest sons, oh, you guys are in for some hard times because when I die, Hal's going to be king. And look who he's hanging. For when his headstrong, headstrong, headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are its counselors, when means and lavish manners meet together, oh, with what wean shall his affection fly? He says, no, no. Warwick says, no, 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 no. No, don't, don't believe that, my lord. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue wherein to gain the language Tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learned, which once attained, your highness knows, comes to no further use, but to be known and hated. The king is studying these lowlifes. Why? So that he better understands and knows them. But once he is king, he will have nothing to do with them. So, like gross terms, the king will, in the perfectness of time, cast off his followers. And their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must meet the lives of other. His grace must meet the lives of other. Meet, judge. By being around people like this, Warwick is saying, how the future king will become a better king Tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. In other words, not likely. Okay? Four, five. All the others leave. And the king is lying there on his pillow, on his bed. And the crown is next to him on the pillow. And Hal comes in, or Prince Harry comes in. Okay? He speaks to his brother, Duke of Clarence, and he says to, talks to Warwick, and he tells them all, I'll, I'll sit and watch by the king. So he sits there, and the king's asleep, notice. And Hal asks, it's a soliloquy, kind of, because the king isn't conscious. But it's not a soliloquy because there's somebody else on the stage at the time. Why does the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation of golden care that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. O oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, Thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire that light and weightless down perforce must move? My gracious lord, my father, his sleep is sound indeed. I mean, he's speaking, his father's not moving. This is the sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. He's starting to think. He's dead. Thy due for me is tears and heavy sorrows. 
of the blood, which nature of and filial tenderness shall, O dear Father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as immediate from thy place in blood, derives itself to me. He thinks his father has died. He takes the crown and sets it on his head. Lo, where it sits, which guard, which God shall guard, and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee will I to mine leave, as tis left to me. And I will pass this on to my son. And the king wakes up. Where would Gloucester Clarence? He asks, why did you leave me alone? Well, where's Hal? He puts the crown on and leaves. And the king's like, what gives? Why'd you leave me alone? We didn't leave you alone. We left you with the prince. Well, he's not here. Where's the crown? The king, 60 or so. The prince hath taken it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick. Try him thither. So, he says to Clarence, See, sons, what things you are, how quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. You're all alike. You all just want your father dead so you can get what your inheritance is, you know. For this the foolish over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achievement gold, etc., etc. So, the prince comes in, and the king asks, Wherefore did he take away the crown? <laughs> like Monty Python, I'm not dead yet, you know. And print, the prince, I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was father, Harry, to that thought. It was your wish that I would never speak again. And that gave you the thought that I would never speak again. I stay too long by thee. In other words, you're just hoping, tick-tock, tick-tock, you know. I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honors before thy hour be ripe? O oh, foolish youth, thou seeks the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Henry the Fourth is actually speaking out of love here. He is saying, you don't want this. You want to put this off as long as you can. He's also kind of speaking out of regret, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's saying, damn, if I had known the burden this would be, I'm just Lancaster, I'll, I'll, excuse me, um, yeah, John Lancaster. I'm just Lancaster. I just want my titles. I don't want the crown. None of that. So, stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offense. In other words, couldn't you even wait just a few hours? And at my death thou hast sealed up my expectations. My, thy life did manifest, thou lovest me not. Thy life, he's saying, all of your behavior up to this point tells me, you don't love me. And thou wilt have me die, assured it. Another good paper topic, people love to do fathers and daughters in Shakespeare. Fathers and sons in Shakespeare is an even better topic because it's one that's very seldom done. First of all, and two, because there's this idea of replacement spoken by the fathers to the sons. Okay? Whether you talk Henry IV with Henry V, Northumberland with Percy, etc. Okay? And thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wedded on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. Canst thou not forbear me half an hour? 
Get thee gone, dig my grave thyself, and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should bedew my earth be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. In other words, go, go, prepare all the pomp and ceremony. Why? Because all the tears, all that will be not for my death, but for your coronation. And he finishes with, When that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, I old and have. When I am dead, and I cannot put any kind of bounds around you, when you're king, then what? Can do whatever you please. Then, he says, you will be peopled with wolves. The prince kneels. And notice, returning the crown. How does he return the crown? Did he just go here? I don't want it. No. If I were directing this, he gets down on his knees and he holds that crown up like this. Showing obeisance. Showing his lowliness. Showing his love. Pardon me, my liege. But for my years, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke, ere you with grief had spoken, I had heard the course of it so far. There's your crown. He that wears the crown immortally, long guard it yours. The king of kings is who he's talking about. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise. In other words, strike me dead, which my most inward true and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. You see my body bending. That's only happening because my interior spirit is prostrate before you. God witness with me when I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, oh, let me in my present wildness die and not let the end try me, is what he's saying. Let me die in my wildness, meaning what? In my sins, unshriven, unforgiven. And never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Purposed. Intended. What He's telling his father, Dad, everything you've seen of me, it's what? It's an act. I want the world to see what? How one can reform. The noble change that I purpose it, coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost my leash to think you were, I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it. The care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore, thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other less fine and carrot is more precious, preserving life in medicine potable. In other words, you, damn crown, have killed my father. But thou most fine, that is most fine gold, most honored, most renowned, hast eat thy bearer up. Thus my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head, to try with it. Try. There's that word again. To contest with it. To do battle with it. As with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the night of it, let God forever keep me, keep it from my head. If I had any, he's saying, positive thoughts, let me not become king. 
O oh, my son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence that thou mightst win the more of thy father's love. God told you to put it on and walk out, pleading so wisely and excuse. Come, come, come here. And here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe and ever I shall read today. <clears throat> God knows, my son, by what paths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. Indirect crooked ways. I think that's a biblical illusion. Because what is the way to heaven? It is narrow and straight. It's not indirect and it's not crooked. And know myself well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation. Why? Because he will inherit the crown. He will not have deposed a king to wear the crown. Okay? So he goes on. <clears throat> and let's, let me pick up with 2.11 and we'll stop here. Therefore, my Harry, be at thy course to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels. That action hence borne out may waste the memory of the former days. More would I, but my lungs are wasted so, etc. What has he just told his son to do? You ever see the film? I never did, but I know what it's about. Wag the dog. Right after Clinton was impeached, or during the impeachment process, he wasn't you know, found guilty, he was acquitted by the Senate. During the impeachment process, what did Clinton do in 1998? Anybody know? He, it wasn't Syria, it was Sudan. He launched a missile attack against Sudan. Why? Because they were producing weapons of mass destruction. Turns out, we discovered several months later, no it wasn't, it really was just an aspirin factory. It was thought, like the king says here, busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels. Deflect attention from what is going on here at home. Why? Because when a nation goes at war, what tends to happen to the people of the nation? Rah! <laughs> they become cheerleaders for their country. Nationalism spikes. Okay? All right. We'll do Act 5 on whatever the day is, Thursday, and start Julius Caesar. Um... Maybe have a quiz over Henry the Fourth, Part Two.